Welcome back to ECE 442-542. Just as a reminder, we finished exam number two, if you've forgotten. And exam number three is going to be on the 11th of April. And then we have a final exam, and I believe that's on the last day of finals, on the Thursday. If you're in 542, you better be thinking about your project. Hopefully, you're already starting to do a little of that. And homework number five will be coming soon to a computer near you, hopefully. And what I want to do today is really tell us where we've been, where have we come from, or what have we covered, or what do you now know. What's the exam number one and exam number two material? It's actually a fair amount of topics or material. Then where are we going? And really where we are going is to design controllers. And that's the remainder of the class. But before we can design controllers, we need to know where do we want our closed loop poles to live? Or where do we want them to be? Or what is our desired or ideal closed-loop transfer function. We want to try to find a way of thinking about that, and if we have a desired closed-loop transfer function, that will guide our decision process or our thinking in selecting a controller. And that's really what I want to cover today, is relative to how do we translate performance specifications into closed loop pole locations. And we'll look at that in terms of an analog S domain, time domain picture. And if you've had 441 or 541, hopefully this will seem very comfortable. If it seems a little weird, that's okay. Just stay with us and we'll transfer that into the Z plane and the z-plane locations or the closed loop poles for a discrete time system and we want to find performance specifications how those then imply where we want our closed loop poles to be in the z-plane or where do we want this desired transfer function to be or what do we want it to have in terms of poles and zeros where have we been? We've talked about difference equations and transfer functions, and we can interrelate those two. And one is in the time domain, the other is in the frequency domain. We should be comfortable with solving difference equations. You had another one of those in the last problem of exam number two, if you saw it that way. It came in the form of a block diagram, but essentially we were solving a difference equation or a discrete time system and we were exciting it, we were kicking it with an exponential input waveform. And that input waveform just so happened to be living or having a mode just like one of the poles of our original system so now we had a repeated pole and we had to remember how to solve a repeated pole problem when we were doing the inverse C transform. We know how to select the sample period. I think most of you were able to get that on exam number two. And now what we are going to be doing is figuring out what we want this omega C to be. What do we want our closed loop bandwidth to be? And that will then impact how we select the sample period capital T or how we select our sampling frequency omega sub S. As I've said several times this semester, you need to commit the Z-transform definition to memory at least until the last day of finals this semester because it will be on the final exam here. We will continue to use this S-plane to Z-plane mapping relationship and we'll use that actually a lot today, but you should remember that Z to the minus one is e to the minus st. It's one sample period of delay. Or though that's the relationship. And so if you look at the, if you stand upright instead of on your head, then you see that z, a one sample period advance, is e to the st, where t is this one sample period. We've figured out 
how to perform an inversely transform. I scrolled up too far. I was going to ask you some questions, but maybe now I've given you the answer. And to obtain a unique waveform expression, we need not only the transform, but we also need to have the region of convergence. That allows us to get the uniqueness. And you should be, and everybody pretty much did get the third problem right on exam two, which is connect these ROCs, these region of convergences, with a interval of support in the time domain. For example, on the left, we have three different regions of convergence. The region of convergence on your left corresponds to what kind of time domain support? That one's causal. The middle one, anti-causal. And the donut, or the annular, it has poles both interior to the region of convergence and exterior. That gives us a two-sided interval of support. We've talked about discrete equivalence, which actually gives you a way. I was talking earlier to someone about have, are we going to do filter design? And I said, well, we've already done filter design because we've covered discrete equivalence. If you know how to design or create an analog filter, now you can obtain the discrete time version of that by means of a discrete equivalent. That's what you now know how to do. And you can do these discrete equivalents either in the time domain, let's say state space, or in the frequency domain with transfer functions. And here are your friends. If you wanted to do that via a zero order hold or incorporate the effect of this zero order hold sitting in front of a system, then you have this relationship for the frequency domain version of that. You simply take the, trans the system's transfer function g of s and put another pole at the origin and then find the z transform of that expression and scale it by this 1 minus c to the minus 1. Or, if you're dealing in the time domain, you can find this state or this system matrix in the discrete time system, capital Phi, as this matrix exponential e to the at, which you can do by hand doing the inverse Laplace. And you can find the input matrix gamma as the integral. Or, there were other ways of doing discrete equivalents. Those first two were both focused on the zero order hold, frequency domain, time domain. And then we have numerical integration, which we also did both ways, state space or transfer function. The pole zero mapping, we were really just worrying about that in the transform case. How do we map poles to poles and zeros to zeros using z is equal to e to the st, that relationship. Now, where are we going? And hopefully, it, once I tell you this, you'll know when we get there, right? You won't have to always be asking. Well, maybe you can. That's fine. And maybe I'll say, just be patient. But this is where we're going. We have been playing with this g of s to g of z relationship. Now we want to put it into a closed loop structure. And we really want to design this capital C of z. That's what we want. We want to build this controller, or I might call it a compensator. We want to design this capital C of z. And how we design that in this class, we're going to focus a lot on what do we want our closed loop transfer function to look like? What do we want capital T sub C of Z to look like? And that's really just this ratio of the Z transform of the output waveform over the Z transform of the input waveform. And inside that capital T sub C of Z, we might see this transfer function, capital C of Z, appearing. And we want to now maybe back that out and determine what do we want capital C of Z to be. And we'll have different ways of finding
or designing that capital C of Z, which is our controller. If this is the case, what do we still need? We still need to be able to determine what we want T sub C of Z to be. Right now, we've just been giving you a G of S or giving you a system and saying, play with it. Now what you want to do is say, oh, what kind of design specifications do I need or do I want to achieve for my particular system? In your project, maybe you want your system to respond to a particular angular input in a certain amount of time or you want it to settle in a certain amount of time. And those are performance specifications that will provide insight into what, what we want capital T sub C of Z to be, our desired closed loop. Now let's actually look at what this might look like in an analog setting by means of what I'm calling performance specifications. What kind of performance do we need from a system? And we're going to be focusing mostly on time domain performance, maybe settling time, maybe percent overshoot, maybe peak time. Those are three that we can kind of cleanly talk about in relationship to a performance measure or performance specification. Let's now see what that looks like for a continuous time system and typically when we're talking about performance, we're constraining our thinking to all be around a second order transfer function. And a second order is just a denominator that's second order. If we have a fifth order system, what we are expecting or what we would probably do is we would pick the dominant modes to be consistent with what we want it to be and the other three would be faster than that. And now when I say faster and I start doing hand gestures, I'm hoping you're starting to visualize where those poles might live either in the S plane or in the Z plane. But we have different ways of parameterizing these poles. On the far right in this transfer function, capital T of S, what does sigma and omega sub d tell us as far as the locations of our poles in the complex S plane? Does it give us any clue as to where those will be positioned in our S plane plot? Could you have already sketched where those poles are in the S plane without me scrolling? Have you seen a quadratic factored in that form on the right. In the middle or the leftmost parameterized transfer function we see an omega sub n, that's the natural frequency. We see a zeta, that's the damping ratio and we're going to start to define all of those terms. On the far right we have sigma which is the amount of damping that's present in that second order system and omega sub d different from omega sub n, omega sub d is the damped frequency of oscillation. Here's the answer. Corresponding to that transfer function is this S domain plot and it's kind of busy but I want you to focus in on those two complex conjugate poles. And this particular parameterized form is assuming an underdamped response. What does underdamped mean? I think I had it already maybe explained. <laughs> underdamped means really that we have complex poles. They're not on the real line. But when we go complex, we start, move, we start oscillating, we start shaking. We have an oscillation in our response. So when we say underdamped, 
then you immediately in the S plane you can and we're assuming these are stable so when they're in the left half plane they have negative real parts you can just assume that you have these two complex conjugate poles the real part it's into the left half plane a distance of sigma that's the damping if I say oh our system has more damping do you see that that means we are moving further into the left half plane and that will translate into a particular relationship on our performance specifications the natural frequency is really the distance those poles are from the origin in the S plane that's the hypotenuse of a right triangle so if you're thinking geometrically you can whoa what did I just you can think of this right triangle it's no more difficult than that we have a hypotenuse which is our natural frequency omega sub n we have our horizontal distance on the real axis which is our damping and we have our vertical distance up into the imaginary direction of our complex plane and that's the damped frequency of oscillation that's omega sub d and if you simply do some trigonometry you can see how those different parameters are related to one another this sigma is actually if I vary that angle theta from 90 degrees then my zeta value is zero when I have purely imaginary poles and when I swing if I increase my damping ratio from zero all the way to one once it's equal to one and that those poles both become real then I'm critically damped the real poles when zeta is equal to one and our under damped relationship is thinking about zeta living between zero and one sigma omega sub d omega sub n zeta all of those are going to be used when we start talking about performance specifications and when I say performance specifications you should be thinking about time domain behavior here's our glossary or here's the terminology that we will be using sigma is how far are those two poles into the left half plane that's the sigma and that's actually equal to zeta times omega sub n where zeta is the damping ratio which is just this ratio of the real part of the pole which is sigma over its hypotenuse or the distance from the origin and you can see then that sigma being equal to zeta omega sub n divided by omega sub n is zeta the damping ratio the distance those poles are from the origin is our natural frequency and the damped frequency is just what's the imaginary component of those complex poles now what I want to do is relate those frequency domain ideas to a step response if we now put a constant into that second order system it will if it's under damped it will overshoot its final value the final value is y sub fv that's the green horizontal line and it will then vibrate around or oscillate around until it gets to where it eventually will go which is what I'm calling y sub final value how many have seen a system that moves like this unfortunately if you hit a pothole what happens 
it probably doesn't oscillate very much because you have a fairly stiff, stiff suspension. But that starts to give you a feel for what this, what might be producing something like this. If you push something that has like a spring and a mass, it will start vibrating back and forth and it'll eventually settle down. And that's really what this represents could be a mass spring damper system where you excite this mass spring damper system, you tell it to move a certain distance, it actually overshoots where you want it to go and then it tries to correct and then it, and it moves around, it oscillates around until it settles. I've indicated a 1% tube, which means whatever my final value is, I take 1% of that and that gives me a tube with which I want my oscillating response to get into and never leave. I think you could see that if I stretched that 1% tube back to the left towards the origin, my response actually does go through that 1% tube, but it doesn't stay there. I'm calling my 1% settling time when my response gets into that 1% tube and doesn't leave. When's the first time that it gets there and never leaves? And that's when I'm going to say I've settled or I reached my settling time. In a sense, that's infinity. My 1% settling time. That's an infinite time horizon, which doesn't have to be very long, which isn't very long in a lot of physical systems. Infinity might be three seconds. That might be your settling time. How long does it take for these oscillations to damp out? Maybe it's 20 milliseconds is an infinite length of time. Here's where that 1% settling time comes from. You've probably seen an exponential written as e to the minus t over tau in your circuits classes where tau is the time constant, e to the minus t over rc for example, where RC is your time constant. Well, if time, little t, is five time constants, if we substitute little t equaling five tau into e to the minus t over tau, then we end up with e to the minus five. And I'm sure you all have e to the minus five memorized. What does e to the minus five equal? Somebody want to pull out their calculator? Do you have e to the minus 5? Do you know what that is? What's e to the minus 5 equal? Point zero zero six seven. What did we say? We wanted it to be a 1% settling time. We wanted it to be less than 0 0.01. Is it? Yes. So that's the approximation that we use. Five time constants is e to the minus five. That's where that five time constants is coming from. And that's equal to this ugly 0 0.0067. Actually, that's very pretty in terms of the concept. That's how we're playing fairly loosely with this definition of 1%. It's not 0 .00 or 0 .01, 0, 0, 0, 0. No, it's e to the minus 5t, or e to the minus 5, which is 0 .0067. Round it, it's 0 .01. But that's an infinite time in terms of where we want to settle. We also, on this diagram, have identified the peak time. How quickly do you reach the peak? That might be an important parameter. That kind of tells you how fast your system is responding. How quickly do you get to that peak? What is little t sub p? And what is the value of your response at that peak time? Well, that's what we will we'll call y max. And we will define a percent overshoot based on y max, 
and the final value. Did it go 20% beyond the final value? Did it go 50% for a 20% overshoot, a 50% overshoot, etc.? When you're designing a system, maybe you want to have a fast system and you'll tolerate a 10% overshoot. Or maybe you say, no, 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 I don't want a 10% overshoot. I can only afford a 5% overshoot, but you can slow it down. So you can make that time to peak a little longer. You can make your system a little slower, and then you'll have a 5% overshoot. Those are the trade-offs that we want to understand when we're talking about performance specifications. First one that we're going to relate in the continuous time case is the 1% settling time. Is it clear what that corresponds to? That's when we get into the 1% tube in that picture. You should have that actually embossed in your memory until the last day of finals this semester. That oscillating response. The settling time T set is five time constants. Five, the tau is, in fact, one over sigma. That's why we can replace five tau with five over sigma. And that's what we're doing here in this blue highlight. We're, seeing, we're saying that e to the minus t over tau is the same as e to the minus sigma t. If you looked at the e to the minus t over rc, you would find that those poles are actually 1 over rc, or what we're calling sigma, into the left half plane. So we'll always be using this relationship, sigma is 1 over tau. If you tell me where your closed loop poles are, their real part, their sigma, <clears throat> excuse me, in the S plane, you can immediately know what the time constant is by sigma is equal to 1 over tau. And once you know tau, you know 5 tau. Or the other way around. If somebody gives you a settling time specification, if they say, I want you to settle in one second, then that immediately tells you how far you want your poles into the left half plane because that will tell you that you divide 5 by that one second and you get sigma is equal to 5. You now know how far into the left half plane in the S plane you need your poles to be. Quiz. Here's a picture of two different sets of complex poles. I have one set I'll say is being highlighted there, what's the real part associated with those complex poles? And it's right there in front of you. Sigma 1 is their real part into the left half plane. And then we have a second set there. And we know what their real part is. It's labeled sigma sub 2. Here's the question. Sigma sub 2, the poles associated with sigma sub 2, the blue highlight, produces a blank system response than sigma 1. And in that blank, it's either slower or faster. So I should have had you doing the thumbs, huh? Up for faster and down for slower. Show me your thumbs. Sigma sub 2 produces a up thumb or down thumb, faster or slower system response versus the poles associated with sigma 1. And if you don't know, I guess you can have a horizontal thumb. 1, 2, show me your thumbs. I don't see many thumbs. Was it that funny? You should be giving me a thumbs up sign, right? Because sigma sub 2 is further into the left half plane, that means we have an e to the minus 6t 
versus an e to the minus 1t, for example. And which of those decays more rapidly, e to the minus t or e to the minus 6t? Again, just plug in some numbers. If I gave you these poles on a final exam, and this is in the S-plane, this is for continuous time, you should be able to answer this yes or no or multiple choice. You should be able to say sigma sub 2's system, the system associated with the poles with a real part of sigma sub 2 is faster than the poles at sigma sub 1. Which pole pair dominates the response? So now we have either sigma 1 or sigma 2. Show me a 1 or a 2. Show me now. 1 dominates, doesn't it? That's the slow. That's what we mean by dominate. And which of these two pole pairs would you be using to select the sample period if you wanted to discretize this? The fastest, which is 2. So now we're using three digits, thumbs, index, and middle finger, right? Up, one, or two. All right, I got you awake anyway with identifying which fingers we're talking about. So now if we specify the settling time, do you see that that translates into a distance of your closed-loop poles into the left half plane? If I say I want a settling time of 200 milliseconds, you now should be able to translate that into where do I want those sigmas, the real part of my complex poles, to live. That's performance specification number one. Here's performance specification number two, dealing with percent overshoot. If I gave you that sketch from before, you could actually compute the percent overshoot, the PO, by finding the maximum point of the response Y, comparing that with the final value, and dividing that by the final value and multiplying it by 100%. That would give you a numerical way or a data way to find the percent overshoot. If you go through the math, and I'm not going to do that, I've spared you the details, but if you go through the math of a second order system that's described or parameterized by those zeta, the damping ratio, and the natural frequency, omega sub n, and the damped frequency, omega sub d, the percent overshoot actually ends up being a function of the damping ratio, zeta. And there's the relationship. It's 100 e to the minus zeta pi over the square root of 1 minus zeta squared. If somebody gives you a percent overshoot, then I want you to be able to translate that through this expression into a value of zeta. And this blue expression for zeta, this is your something to do tonight when you get home, is solve this black equation, PO equal 100, and solve for zeta. And you should end up with the blue box. The only problem with doing that is a lot of times we forget to take the square root of what's in that blue box. But we need the square root, and that percent overshoot is given as a 20% or 30%. So you would use 20 or 30 as the PO. So if I said I wanted a zeta, I'm sorry, if I said I wanted a percent overshoot of 50%, I would plug in 50 for PO, divide it by 100, take the natural log of that one half and square it, and that's in my numerator. Then I would divide by pi squared. I know you celebrated pi day on our exam, so you know what pi squared is. Yes? What's pi squared? 0.5. 
roughly. Ten. So if somebody gives you pi squared, just be thinking ten. Downstairs you have ten plus the natural log of one half squared. You do that division, find that ratio, and take the square root, and that will be zeta. If somebody were to plot percent overshoot versus zeta, they would get this nonlinear curve. And you could have this on your crib sheet if you didn't want that formula. You could just have this, and you could just have certain or if I say, oh, give me a percent overshoot of 45%, you would come over here and you would say, oh, here's 45%, and now I know what the zeta value needs to be. It needs to be a little bit bigger than 0.2. If I say 5% overshoot, what's the zeta value? 0.7. And that's a, a sweet, that's the Goldilocks value for zeta, 0.7. Yes? So is this independent of the system? This is not independent of the system. So if somebody gives you a system, then that system will possess some natural characteristics. And one of those, if it's under damped, will be its damping ratio. It will have a zeta value. What we're talking about now is maybe you're not happy with that zeta value and you want to change it. And you say, oh, in this system I can tolerate, let's say you had a robot and you're working in tight quarters and now you had a 50% overshoot and the 50% threw you into the wall. So you maybe wouldn't be able to go 50%. Maybe you say, oh, if, as long as I stay 30% overshoot or less, I can move fast enough around. Now you'll never forget percent overshoot, right? It corresponds to bloody knuckles. But, do you see how now a 10% is roughly 0.6 for zeta? Point, uh, 5% is roughly 0.7. And that zeta value corresponds to particular angles that the, these poles make with the real line in the complex S domain. Here's a plot, and that red curve or the red pole and the blue pole are supposed to be the same distance away from the origin. I didn't get out my dividers and measure it, but just use your imagination if they don't look the same. They're supposed to be the same distance away. So they have the same natural frequency. They don't oscillate the same. They don't have the same percent overshoot characteristics. But if you looked at the cosine of theta, Theta is the angle that this red dashed line makes with the real line or the blue dashed line makes. That's the theta that I'm talking about. And these thetas are in the S plane. We're going to have another theta in the Z planes. And don't get them confused. They don't explain the same concept. Theta in the S plane usually refers to this angle that these complex dominant poles make with the real line. If we take the cosine of theta, cosine of theta is just this adjacent over hypotenuse. And what's the adjacent? That's zeta omega sub n. Well, that's zeta omega sub n over omega sub n is zeta. We now know if somebody gives us zeta, we can find theta. If somebody gives us theta, and now I usually start talking about pizza or something. Does that look sort of like a wedge of pizza? The theta? That's now the terminology that I might use. I might <clears throat> be talking about a pizza wedge. And 
hopefully you understand if you have a really big piece of pizza, a really big wedge, what that corresponds to relative to a thinner slice of pizza. Theta 1 is a bigger wedge than theta sub 2 in this case. The damping ratio increases from purely imaginary down from z, z equals 0 all the way down to z equal 1. As you increase zeta, make your damping ratio closer to 1. <clears throat> Excuse me. Got all choked up thinking about pizza. <clears throat> you decrease the percent overshoot. The bigger that wedge, the more oscillation you have. The smaller the wedge, the less oscillation you have. And I've probably just answered a question. But zeta equal to 0.7, if you now did the inverse cosine of 0.7, I hope you would get 45 degrees, roughly. That's the Goldilocks value of zeta in the S-plane, 45 degrees. If somebody just said, give me some poles, you'd say, oh, I can give you a pretty good set here. Just hand them poles that have a zeta value of 0.7 or an angle of 45 degrees. That's a good trade-off between percent overshoot and peak time. And what's the percent overshoot for a zeta value of 0.7? Well, we just have to slide up a little bit and find zeta of 0.7, go up and over, oh, that's a 5% overshoot. That's not much overshoot when our angle is 45. If our angle is 30 degrees, what's going to happen to the overshoot? If our pi wedge is even narrower, 30 degrees versus 45, our wedge is 30, what's the percent overshoot? Small, smaller than what it was at 0.7, so it's smaller than 5%. So you're not gaining a whole lot when you shrink from 45 all the way down to zero as far as percent overshoot is concerned. You have a lot of overshoot between 45 and purely oscillatory where you just continue to oscillate back and forth. Yes? So what's the trade-off? Why do I want not want to just go all the way to real poles. Why might I tolerate some percent overshoot? I may not want oscillation, but what does that provide me? It gives me a quicker time to peak, so my system becomes a little faster for the same natural frequency. So I peak a little quicker when I have some overshoot versus critically damped. I can get to where I want to go quicker <clears throat> than if I just had purely real poles that were equal. This performance specification then, you specify a percent overshoot. Somebody says, oh, I want 5% overshoot. Oh, I need a zeta of 0.7. I want a 10% overshoot. What's the zeta? 0.6. I want a 50% overshoot. What's the zeta? 0.2. I just had those three points highlighted on that graphic before. Theta sub 2 in this picture produces more or less overshoot than the poles associated with theta 1. If I have poles at theta sub 2 and these have their twins down below, they're coming in conjugate pairs, <clears throat> I have poles that are equiangular from the real line, one at positive theta 2, one at minus theta sub 2, their overshoot, what did I say, theta sub 2 produces more or less overshoot than theta sub 1. More is up with the thumb, less is down. 
theta sub 2, can you see theta sub 2 versus theta 1? Theta sub 2 produces more or less overshoot than theta 1. We ready to show me your thumb? 1, 2, 3. What do you want for a pizza slice in terms of less overshoot? Smaller theta, don't you? So theta sub 2 produces less, thumbs down, than theta 1. One more performance specification, peak time. We've talked about distance into the left half plane, the real part. We've talked about the angle. Now let's talk about the imaginary piece of those poles, which is the damped frequency omega sub d. The time to peak, if you go through the analysis for this second order system, the time to peak is related to the imaginary component of those two poles by pi over omega sub d. Pi's in a lot of our analysis, isn't it? No wonder I like pi. Well, both pi and pie. I like both. All right. Time to peak is pi over omega sub d. So if somebody gives you a time to peak specification or a number, you now know how, what the imaginary component of those two complex poles needs to be. It's just pi divided by time to peak. Now I can have two different pairs of complex poles. Two that are at plus and minus j omega sub d1, those are the blue poles. And you notice that they have the same real component, which means, what does that mean? If I excited these two systems, the blue system and the red system, and those are wildcat, red and blue, never mind. So now I have a red system and a blue system. If I excited those, what's the same? What performance parameter is the same? If I hit both of those systems with a step input, what would I see that's the same? What's the same between the blue pole and the red pole? That's not a tough question to answer. What's the same? Sigma, the real part. If they're the same distance into the left half plane, what's sigma translate into? Settling time. So if I excited both of those systems, they're both going to have the same settling time. The 1% settling time is the same for the red system and the blue system. What's different? Peak time because they have what? <clears throat> different imaginary components. They also have different angles, don't they? So they also have a different percent overshoot. They share one of the performance specs, but they don't share the other two. We are now going to compare their peak time behavior. If somebody gives you time to peak of, let's say, 50 milliseconds, do you see how that translates into an imaginary component of these pairs of complex poles? You simply take pi and divide by whatever I just said, 50 milliseconds, 0.05. So you multiply 20 times pi. 2 pi is 6.28, so multiply that 62.8 would be the imaginary component if you wanted a 50 millisecond peak time. See how these numbers just fly? Or come into existence depending on what somebody gives you. Omega sub D2 is the red. I should have made it red. Produces a 
slower or faster system, a longer or larger or smaller peak time than omega sub D1. So those are the two blanks. Let's just focus on the first one. Omega sub D2 produces a faster or slower system than omega sub D1. Is our system faster for omega sub D1 or slower? All right, faster is up, slower is down. I'm just focusing on whether omega sub D2 produces a faster system than omega sub D1 or a slower system than omega sub D1. And I'm suggesting you can maybe use something on the screen to determine that. All right, up is faster, down is slower. Show me your thumbs at the count of three. One, two, three. So now I've taken off my glasses. Good luck trying to find your thumb, huh? Most of you have it up, which is faster. Is that true? And that's correct. So omega sub D2, do you see that omega sub D2 is bigger than omega sub D1 in magnitude? Now if we put a bigger number in the denominator for T sub P, what ha oops, I just, shoot. Now we know the second answer, right? What's the peak time? Smaller or larger? This one is smaller. And that's all based on that relationship. You plug in a bigger omega sub D, it's downstairs, it makes T sub P smaller. In this case, T sub P sub 2 is less than T sub P sub 1. Now what we want to do is translate those into the z-plane pole locations, these performance specifications. Settling time, percent overshoot, and peak time. What do those shapes look like in the z-plane? In the s-plane, what did they look like? What was settling time? Sigma or vertical lines, right? How far over into the left half plane are these vertical lines? We push it further, it's faster. Percent overshoot. When I say percent overshoot, you think pizza, wedge, right? P, percent overshoot pizza. There, that, you just have it all now, right? P for percent overshoot and pizza. But if I give you percent overshoot, you're thinking a wedge. You want less overshoot, you want that wedge to be smaller. These are all in the S domain. Time to peak, what do you think? Or what do you see when I say time to peak? Horizontal lines. How far are we away from the real line? What's the imaginary component in the S plane? We want less peak time, what, what do we do with omega sub D, the imaginary component, bigger or smaller? If we want less peak, we want the omega sub D to be bigger, don't we? All right, so that's what we have for S domain. We have vertical lines, horizontal lines, and wedges. What shapes do we have in the Z plane? I bet you just can't wait, huh? Well, these are going to be a little bit more exciting than vertical, horizontal, and angle. <laughs> Let's see what we do. If I want to translate these into the Z-plane, what do you think I need? <laughs> 
I want to translate these performance specs into the z-plane pole locations. How do we make this transition or this mapping between the s-plane and the z-plane? We aren't changing the rule book. It's the same. We still look at z is equal to e to the st. All right, so now if somebody says, oh, we have now parameterized in the s-plane by a real part, sigma, and an imaginary part, omega sub d. And based on those, sigma and omega sub d, you can tell me a lot, can't you? Sigma, settling time, omega sub d, peak time, their angular relationship, pizza, perform percent overshoot, right? I'm sorry if you don't like pizza. Think something that you like to eat with wedges. I don't know. Lasagna? What, some, uh, that's you. All right. So now, let's plug in this parameterized form of S. E to the minus sigma plus j omega sub d t. Let's distribute that t. Well, let's not. Let's write this in terms of the damping ratio, zeta, and the natural frequency, omega sub n, so that we have all of these parameters that we can think about. Sigma and omega sub d, real part and imaginary part of our poles in the s-plane. We could also parameterize that as e to the minus zeta omega sub n, that's sigma, plus j omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared t. There's sigma, that's omega sub d. And we can get all of that by geometry just by looking at the angles and the real part, imaginary part, etc. Now what do we do? Well, let's just push that a little bit further. We now have z is equal to, now let's distribute that t through to the two different terms in the exponent of e. We have e to the minus zeta omega sub n t and we have e to the j omega sub n and sometimes we like to put those two together omega sub n t square root of 1 minus zeta squared. Again this you might see as sigma and this omega sub n times the square root of 1 minus zeta squared is omega sub d. So you might see this written many different ways. What have I now described z as? What is e to the minus sigma t or e to the minus zeta omega sub n t? That's just some magnitude, isn't it? That's just a real number. And e to the j omega sub n t squared to 1 minus zeta squared, because it's j, that's an angle. We've now written this really in polar form, magnitude at an angle, the location of z in the complex plane, parameterized in terms of these variables that we're now comfortable with in the s plane. Or we could write this as r, where this is now r. That's the distance away from the origin in the z-plane. e to the j, and let me collapse that omega sub n square root of 1 minus zeta squared into an omega sub dt. And sometimes I might 
say, let me just collapse omega sub dt into something, and I'm going to say that something is an angle, theta sub d. There's the theta, but it has a subscript d. That's the discrete time angle, and it means something different than the theta in the s-plane. But this is now e to the j theta sub d. Now I'm defining theta sub d to be omega sub dt. And theta sub d really has units of radians per sample. But we'll get into that in a minute. But this is now a polar form of the z-plane pole locations. What if I wanted the rectangular form? Well, I could write that in terms of r and theta sub d. That could just be r cosine using Euler theta sub d plus j r sine theta sub d. Have you already sketched the z-plane diagram? If my poles are here, what's that distance between the origin and that pole? What's the polar form of that set of complex poles. It has a magnitude and an angle. The magnitude is just the distance from the origin. That's the R. I now have R and this angle here is theta sub d. Do you see why you don't want to get your thetas mixed up? Theta in the s-plane is on the left hand side Theta sub d in the discrete time is relative to the zero being in the right-hand side direction or the horizontal, positive horizontal line. We could also describe this distance as r cosine theta sub d. That's, let's say, the x distance. And this distance, let's say y bar, is r sine theta sub d. Let's now see some of these settling or some of these performance specifications, what they translate into in terms of shapes in the z-plane. Number one, One percent settling time. For reference, what influenced settling time in the S plane? What shape did we think of when we said settling time in the S plane? We have vertical, we have angle, and we have horizontal. Were we vertical or horizontal? Uh, not what you are right now. I hope you're vertical right now because that's what this is, right? This is vertical. I don't want you horizontal yet. When you get home, you can go horizontal. Not now, right? I know this lecture is challenging that idea. But now we're dealing with vertical. We had either a sigma 1 or a sigma sub 2. What does that look like if we map those 
into the z-plane. If I kept sigma sub 1 the same, and I just varied omega along sigma sub 1, what would that map to in the z-plane through this z is equal to e to the st? What would stay the same if I kept sigma 1 the same? Go back here, and now if I keep sigma the same, what is constant in this parameterized form for z? Capital T isn't varying, is it? It's fixed. Sigma, I have e to the minus sigma t. What does that define? What is equal to e to the minus sigma t? R. What does R represent in the z-plane? The distance from the origin. Do you see what geometric shape settling time looks like? That's supposed to be a circle. Now, which is which? Sigma sub 1 is faster or slower than sigma sub 2? <laughs> so tonight you have your homework, right? You can go home and go thumbs up, thumbs down, faster, slower, which is which? It's a challenge, I know. You might go horizontal on me, but now you have vertical, right? Sigma sub 1 is slower or faster than sigma sub 2? Which way should I have my thumb? Down. It's slower. So if that's the case, which circle is bigger in the z-plane? Sigma 1 circle or sigma 2 circle? Capital T is the same. I now want to know which is faster or slower in the z-plane. It has to be consistent with what's faster and slower in the s-plane. Sigma 1 was slower. That means its circle must be bigger than the circle corresponding to sigma sub 2. So if I can draw circles, which I cannot do, but let's say this is now r1 is equal to e to the minus sigma 1t. And now I should have color coded this, but I didn't. Oh boy. That's supposed to be centered about the origin. This is now Do you see why those circles look the way they do? R1 is e to the minus sigma 1t. R sub 2 is e to the minus sigma sub 2t. T is the same. What? How are sigmas related? Sigma sub 2 is bigger than sigma 1. So R2 is smaller than R1. So this tells us R2 is less than R1. And what happens if we just keep varying those sigmas? We get concentric circles. We get bullseyes. A bullseye. And where do we want to go if we're thinking bullseye? Probably smaller, which means faster. So the more accurate your shot, the smaller the circle, the faster your system. What happens if I would put a circle corresponding to the imaginary axis? Where would that circle be in the z-plane? If I put a circle, if I said, oh, I'm on the imaginary axis, where does that translate into in the z-plane? Mm. What's the imaginary axis in the s-plane transition between? If I went from the left half plane into the right half plane, what happened to my system behavior? In the left half plane, I'm stable. In the right half plane, I'm unstable. 
If we have causal systems, what happens in the z-plane? Where's that boundary of stability? The unit circle, right? 1, r equal 1. What's the sigma on the imaginary axis? 0. What's e to the 0? 1. We're on the unit circle. If we go in the right half plane, we go outside the unit circle. So r sub 2 is, well, here, let me write down what I've been saying. We now have a bullseye, and somebody's hitting the target, aren't they? Which means that these concentric circles if I have a smaller circle that corresponds to a slower or faster system. A smaller circle. So if I'm looking at r sub 2 and r sub 1, and if r sub 2 is less than r1, then r sub 2 is faster. and r sub 1 is slower. In this particular specification, performance spec, if I specify a settling time, what does that translate into in the z-plane? What geometric parameter? The radius. That gives me r or circles. Settling time, circles. Get the connection. In the S-plane, what did settling time correspond to? Vertical lines. Distance into the S-plane. Now we want something faster, we shrink that circle. We make our distance from the origin smaller. We make the real part of our poles tiny if we want a faster system. Let's see if we can come up with some equations for this. Suppose you're given T settle, the settling time, and you want to find R. For now, let's say that the settling time has been parameterized in terms of the number of sample periods, n sub s. n sub s is the number of samples to settle. t is the sample period. And n sub s is the number of sample periods. So you could solve for n sub s if you wanted to. n sub s is now t settle over the sample period. And what was the relationship that we have already looked at when we talked about settling time? We said x at sample n sub s was r raised to the n sub s times the initial condition. We've derived that already. We've used that. Or we want that to now be the same as our 1% of where we started. The, 1 or the initial condition is the same, so now we have a relationship between R and N sub S.
all we do now is take the logarithm. And let's use the base 10 log since we have 0 0.01. If we do that, then we have n sub s times the log base 10 of r is equal to the log base 10 of 0 0.01, which is minus 2. That's where that minus 2 comes in. And now we can see that the log base 10 of r is equal to minus 2 over n sub s. And I'm going to use that relationship a lot. But now I can take the anti-log of both sides and solve for r. r is now equal to 10 to the minus 2 over n sub s. And that's now a performance specification. You give me how many samples you want to be in your 1% settling time and you can I can tell you what your radius needs to be in the closed loop poles. You say, oh, I want a settling time of 20 samples. Boom, you plug it in and you now know exactly what R is. I'm having so much fun, I really don't want to leave, but we're going to have to leave and we'll pick up at this point with performance specs next time.